Okay, so we're going to look at the uh, the non-cortical structures um, in, in the telencephalon. And before we do that, I just want to remind you that the telencephalon is is the bulk of the brain. This is a um, it's not a perfect dissection, but it's a it's a good one. Um, what I did here was I cut the internal capsule, and by cutting the internal capsule, I removed everything but the telencephalon from the adult human brain. And what you're looking down on, this is the front, this is the back, the eyes would be here, this is the temporal lobe. Um, you're looking down on what I would call the telencephalic cap. And this is what we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to have a little detour into the dorsal thalamus as well, but this is what we're going to spend most of the rest of the time on. Um, and what we're going to start out with is not uh, the cortex, but, uh, but three different uh, other structures that are, depend on uh, the telencephalon. And the first is, is a conceptual group of, of places in the brain called the limbic system. And the, the exact uh, uh, components that you include in the limbic system are, uh, are not that important. These, what I put up here is uh, the, the ones that are typically in, included. So the cingulate gyrus, which is, is, the, uh, is on the medial surface of, of each hemisphere, the cingulate gyrus, it's just dorsal to the um, corpus callosum, the orbital frontal cortex, um, and then the parahippocampal gyrus, which includes the uh, hippocampus and the amygdala, and then also the thalamus and the connection between the hippocampus and the thalamus, which is the, the fornix. So all of these together are called, are, are termed the limbic system. And you will hear the limbic system uh, talked about in terms of anatomy and also talked about in terms of function. And my, my only um, suggestion here is uh, don't get too excited by the actual name limbic. Um, it, it may be part of somebody's uh, inclusion. It may be included by somebody in the limbic system or not. Uh, the fact of the matter is that most of the brain is going to inform upon our um, motivational and affective states. These are thought to be core components of the uh, part of the brain that gives rise to affective and emotional states. They're not the only components, but they are core to them. Okay? So the limbic system is, in, is uh, thought to be critical for affect, motivation, and to get to have affect and motivation, one needs learning and memory. So affect, motivation, learning, and memory. Okay. Let's go on to uh, the basal ganglia. Remember that the basal ganglia have two core components. Those are the striatum and the pallidum. So these are the two core components. The striatum consists of two different parts, caudate and putamen. They were separated by the internal capsule, as we will see. Um, and the pallidum consists of the globus pallidus, internal and external. But these two areas function with three other areas that are now included in the modern grouping of the basal ganglia. And those, these are both telencephalic. The uh, subthalamus is diencephalic and the substantia nigra is midbrain. But these two, the subthalamus and the substantia nigra, which has two completely different parts, they might as well not even be called the same thing, but they are because they're, they're intermixed. The cells are intermixed in the same place. So substantia nigra pars reticulata and substantia nigra pars compacta. We looked at pars compacta. These, these are the neurons that make dopamine and that are black because they contain neuromelanin. Okay, so these are the components of the, uh, of the basal ganglia. One other term that you might hear is called the lenticulate lenticular, lenticulate nucleus, which consists of the putamen plus the pallidum. And we'll see why that is. It's basically a lens shape. We'll see that uh, when we go, uh, well, 
we will see that now when we go over to the slides. So let's meet all these various places. If we, if we look at this section, this is the back, this is the front, here's the temporal lobe, here's the temporal lobe, this is part of the lateral ventricle, this is an anterior commissure, we don't care about that. And what you see here is the, um, is the basal ganglia here and here. Here's the thalamus, it's, it's adjoining on to the third ventricle. Here is the third, I'm sorry, here is the internal capsule, and here is the putamen, the external globus pallidus, the internal globus pallidus. The putamen, the external globus pallidus, and the internal globus pallidus. Here is another view of this. In this, uh, this is again an axial or horizontal section the front, the back, the temporal lobe. And this structure right here, next to the lateral ventricle, is the caudate. Anytime you see gray matter next to the lateral ventricle, it is always going to be caudate. That's all it is. It can only be caudate. The only gray matter touching the lateral ventricle is caudate. Separated by this internal capsule, and we'll look at this again later, is uh, separated from the caudate by the internal capsule is this structure here, which is the putamen. So caudate and putamen together form the, uh, for, form the striatum. And then this right here, bordering the third ventricle, this is the thalamus. So thalamus, internal capsule, putamen, Caudate. Now we're going to look at a, a coronal section. Oh, sorry, one more. We're going to look at um, another, another axial section, and this shows you caudate next to the lateral ventricle, putamen, and now just one part of the globus pallidus. So this is globus pallidus external. Caudate, internal capsule, putamen, and uh, and globus pallidus external. The globus pallidus and the, uh, and the uh, caudate together, they look lens-like. They form a lens. And that is why these two together, is, they're called a lenticular nucleus. Now that's just an anatomical term. These are not functionally the, the same. Caudate and putamen are functionally the same. They are functionally the striatum. That is a functional grouping. The lenticular nucleus is simply an anatomical grouping. OK. Now we're looking at a coronal section. We see the lateral ventricle. So we know lateral ventricle. Whenever you see the lateral ventricle, first of all, you know you're in the telencephalon. That's the only place you can be. That's the only place that has two, uh, has a non-midline um, ventricle, part of the ventricle. So here's the ventricle, and you see this gray matter right next to it, right next to it on both sides. That's caudate. And you see it's, it's, stretching, it's stretching little arms across to its friend, its, its developmental partner, which is putamen. Here came the internal capsule and separated that. But these two, these two structures are one and the same. They development, developmentally and functionally um, are, are this, are this, come from the same place, do the same thing and they have these little islands of connection. Inside of the, uh, of the putamen is the globus pallidus external, and then inside of that is the globus, I'm sorry, globus pallidus external, and inside of that is globus pallidus internal. These three together form a lens, and that's the lenticular nucleus. Here's the third ventricle, here's the thalamus. Okay, great. So that is, um, and I just want to show you that the, the caudate actually follows that ram's horn of the lateral ventricle. So now what I'm showing you is not a mid-sagittal section, but a sagittal section that's taken off, off midline. And what you see is the ventricle. Here's the ventricle. And mirroring that ventricle is this structure here, which is caudate. And it's attached to its friend, the putamen, but here's the caudate. 
and it's going to go all the way around and it's going to wrap, there's going to be a tail of the caudate in the temporal lobe. So from the frontal lobe all the way around to the temporal lobe and there will be a tail of the caudate in the, in the uh, temporal lobe. Here is, again, substantia nigra pars compacta. We're back in midbrain. You see the aqueduct. You see the superior colliculus. That's a little uh, pineal gland that's, that's sort of floating off there. Um, in and amongst the, these uh, pars compacta cells are reticulata cells, but they don't have melanin, so it's, it's less obvious. And the final uh, piece of the... Uh, of the um, Basal ganglia conglomeration, modern conglomeration of basal ganglia, is the subthalamic nucleus, which is right here. Okay, so here we are. We're in rostral midbrain as it's merging with thalamus. Here's the superior colliculus. This is the aqueduct becoming the, the third ventricle. Here's the pulvinar. Here's the uh, medial geniculate. Here's the red nucleus. Here's the cerebral peduncles the substantia nigra, and then there's a little lens shape right here. And I left this blank, um, and on this side, I actually put a, an arrow there because it's, it's a little hard to see otherwise. That's the anatomy of the basal ganglia. And now we're just going to go over and look at a little bit of circuitry. We're going to have a whole uh, chapter on this, but I want to give you a little bit of a framework under which to understand basal ganglia function. The input to the basal ganglia is, uh, comes from cortex, from the input from cortex to the basal ganglia comes into one place, that is the striatum. So the striatum is the receiving zone. And this is an excitatory connection. And then the striatum can only get out back to cortex via the output. So this is the input and this is the output. In out. And the output comes from globus pallidus internal and substantia nigra pars reticulata. These, the, the striatum, the, the caudate and the putamen were separated by the internal capsule. The globus pallidus internal and the substantia nigra pars reticulata were separated by the uh, cerebral peduncle. So these are, these are developmentally uh, the same. So this contains the output, which goes to the thalamus, which goes back to the cortex. All of this is on one side. So basal ganglia, if there is a problem in this basal ganglia circuit, which side of the body, movements on which side of the body will be affected? Think about it. Think about it. Contralateral side. Because this basal ganglia is, is modulating cortical motor cortex on the same side. So motor cortex affects movements on the opposite side. So basal ganglia will affect the coordination of movements or, or will affect movements on the opposite side. Now the basic function of the basal ganglia is what, we, what I'll refer to as action selection. In other words, there are a lot of things I could do right now. I could jump up and down, I could wave my arms in the air, I could shake my head, but I can really only do uh, one of those things at a time. Um, in fact, I have difficulty chewing and walking at the same time. So we really are, are, are not meant to multiplex with our, our muscles. And in fact, there are muscles, um, when you're talking about one set of muscles, you can't use one set of muscles to do two different things. You cannot look left and look right at the same time. You cannot turn your head to the left and turn your head to the right. You cannot move your, abduct your arm and adduct your arm at the same time. You have to choose one action. And the chooser is the, uh, is the basal ganglia. So the way that the basal ganglia approaches this problem of action selection is that it decides, it, it, or the way that it works, is that at rest, you do nothing. The basal ganglia is going to say, no, 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 no. It's a big wet blanket on movement. And that's because the output from here is inhibitory. This is an inhibitory output from the basal ganglia. This is the basal ganglia to the thalamus. So we're keeping this in, we're, we're inhibiting the tha thalamus, which is preventing the thalamus from exciting the cortex. Now, what happens is that there is a 
there's two there's two uh, inhibitions. There's an in inhibition from the striatum to the globus pallidus internal and the substantia nigra pars articulata, and then there's an inhibition from here to the thalamus. So two negatives make a positive. This is called disinhibition. And so when this happens, you turn off that wet blanket, you lift that wet blanket, you release a movement from inhibition. You release the movement. You enable it by releasing it. So in general, the types of, of problems that can give rise to, uh, or basal ganglia gives rise to, to two different types of uh, motor disorders. One is too much of that wet blanket. There's no movement. You can't get out from underneath the, the uh, wet blanket. And that is the case in, in a disease such as uh, Parkinson's disease. There's a poverty of movement. There, it's, it, there's too much inhibition coming out of the basal ganglia. That's called a hypokinetic, hypo, hypokinetic disorder. And the other type of disorder is the opposite, which is a hyper. There's not enough inhibition. And in fact, there's excess movements. So there are two different, there are two uh, classic uh, types, uh, 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 classic diseases that are hyperkinetic. One is hemibilismus, which is typically due to a stroke where uh, ballistic mo movements are released, um, typically on one side, typically only uh, affects, the stroke affects one side. So there'll be just these ballistic movements of the arms or the legs or sometimes of the face as well. The other classic hyperkinetic disorder is, an, is a uh, inherited genetic disorder called Huntington's, Huntington's disease. And this is where there are these choreiform uh, movements that are released um, uh, un involuntarily. In fact, they become harder and harder to, uh, to suppress. Okay, so now what we're going to do is go back over to the slides, and we're going to talk about the final uh, element of the uh, of the um, uh, of the subcortical part of the of the telencephalon, and that's the amygdala. So the amygdala is, a, is in the rostral part of the uh, of, of the temporal lobe, just in front of the of the rostral pole of the hippocampus, and the amygdala is essentially homeland security central. It is going to tell you what's what's the temperature of the environment, not in terms of temperature, but in terms of danger. Are we at low level danger or, or you know, are we at green, yellow, red, whatever, whatever the warning signs are? Where are we? How vigilant do we need to be? And to assign uh, importance to certain social cues, we learn, we use our amygdala when we're young to learn how to assign importance to different social cues. There are a couple of diseases where the amygdala is, is um, selectively lesioned. And one of these is a, is a disease called urbach wythe And about half of the urbach wythe patients have a, they just have a connective, uh, they have a hyalinosis. They, they, they basically lesion their amygdala on both sides um, because of a cell biological problem that we won't go into. But the upshot of that is, is that these individuals have a difficult time recognizing fear, feeling fear. They are disinhibited. They act as though there is no fear. Um, and so uh, this is a classic experiment that was done on one such individual with Urbic Wythe. It may be a little bit of a, um, a of a um, hyperbole that th this is not every patient with urbach wythe but this is uh, certainly one of the famous cases where if you look at facial expressions, okay, so we're going to take a little detour into facial expressions. Uh, here's a neutral face, here's a fearful face, here's an, a face of, uh, of a smile. Um, and what you can see is that the fearful face depends mostly on the eyes. Okay, if the, if the eyes show fear and the mouth doesn't show anything, the interpretation is fear. Whereas 
the opposite is true for a, a smile. If the mouth shows a smile and the eyes don't, we still are, we have a e relatively easy time uh, interpreting this as, as a smile. So what happened with this Urbe Gwaithi uh, patient, she was asked to tell, to, to recognize what is the facial expression as, they, as she was shown these different facial expressions. And these are computer modified. So what she, she could not recognize expressions of fear. She didn't recognize expressions of fear, but she could recognize smiles. Then the experimenters told her, I want you to look at the eyes. Okay, when she was told to look at the eyes, she did in fact recognize the fear. So what was happening, at least in this individual, is that she simply wasn't uh, making the correct eye movements to get the information that was needed to recognize fear. And once she did uh, look at the eyes, she could recognize fear. She was looking at the mouth, and so she was able to recognize uh, uh, a smile, um, but she wasn't able to recognize fear. One of the most interesting things about this case is that after she, she walked away, um, she instantly stopped looking at the eyes. So even though she knows she has this problem, it was basically impossible for her to remember uh, to correct herself by looking at the eyes. Um, the, these amygdala uh, issues are, um, are pretty rare. Urbach Wythe is pretty rare. But one place where it's, it's really critical is in making emotional memories. And emotional memories uh, have a big uh, footprint in modern world because uh, they are at root what, what the, the problem in post-traumatic stress disorder. So in post-traumatic stress disorder, there's an experience that um, has a, a hard wired uh, connection to an outflow of, of, of panic, of arousal and, and vigilance and panic. And so there are these trigger stimuli that elicit a, um, a very uh, uh, profound uh, response. Um, and that, the, the association between the trigger and the response is made in the amygdala. And so people are thinking about uh, strategies to, to help people with PTSD um, uh, mitigate those, the, the hypervigilance and the, uh, the triggered reactions um, through an understanding of how that occurs in the amygdala. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the dorsal thalamus.